Muzzle-loading stories at Safari Camp, William Hovey Smith, 2015. Now, this group of stories was actually recorded at Spear Safari's camp in 2007 while we were having cocktails and sundowners after the hunt. Now, a lot of these stories I've actually written about in extreme muzzleloading as well as my other e-books. One of the things about muzzleloading that most people don't appreciate is that we have an enormous long history. The first muzzle-loading guns that were really portable were matchlocks. Now for those of you who have maybe heard of matchlocks but don't really know how they work, what a matchlock is, it uses a nitrated cord, which is usually all oh, about yay long to start with, and you light the end of it and blow up a glowing red-hot coal and this is fixed in a cock which falls in a pan full of powder and if everything goes well ignites your powder charge. Now match locks were used as firearms longer than any other ignition system. Far longer than cartridges and far longer than the percussion system. And the match lock was considered to have been perfected quote unquote in the 1500s. Well, I've had an occasion to use a matchlock and actually hunt with a matchlock. And it is quite an experience, and I'd like to share that with you. Since most people would have better sense than to try it themselves. The gun I had is a Japanese matchlock, a Tanigashima. And when it arrived, uh, my wife and I decided we would rename it, and we called it Tagi for short. But Tanigashima is mostly a great long barrel. By great and long, I mean the entire gun is this long. And it, as the Japanese had very little wood, uh, they didn't waste it. It doesn't have a butt stock. It's shaped more like a Japanese sword, straight and then a small curve down at the end. And this thin butt stock, which is about that wide, is held against the cheek. So there's nothing resting back on the shoulder. You support the gun with your arm and then hold it against your cheek. And the Japanese matchlock is also a variety known as a snapping matchlock. So you do actually have a trigger underneath. And you cock the cock, and it fix the match, open the pan, pull the trigger, and if all goes well, the charge goes off. Well, match cord is not a common thing that you can pick up at the local hardware store. So I had to make my own. And we tried various things. We tried cigarettes, for example. They burn. And yeah, they did, but they blew stuff all over the place, and that wasn't really satisfactory. So the next thing we tried was uh, wisteria vine. And dried wisteria vine that was charred on one end, it would support a good glowing coal, but you had to drill holes in it and take a large safety pin and pin it in the cock to hold it in place. So thus tried, we went out to think of what game we could possibly shoot with. So the only thing I could think of that was slow enough that we could possibly have multiple opportunities at was the anteater. Now the anteater is well known in southern North America. And it's more like the spiny anteater you have here in South Africa or the pangolin. And our anteaters are about like yay, so high, and completely covered with white calcium shell. And uh, the only thing about hunting anteaters is anteaters are nocturnal. I've got enough challenges it is with just the gun. So we had to wait until special conditions existed. That is, there was a flood so we could get the anteaters moving around in daylight. Well, as it so happens, there was a rainy spell, 
and the swamp lands along the Buffalo Creek in my home county were flooded. So this moved the anteaters to higher ground and had them active during the day. So this was ideal conditions to go on. Now Buffalo Swamp, like any swamp, is pretty thick. So we got our gear and we went out and started slowly walking through the swamp trying to find some anteaters. And after a time, sure enough, and there one was, right over there. Okay. Got it. Except there were a few necessary things to do first. We had to retire, light the match, blow up a good coal, feed it through the stock, carefully affix it in the cock, cock it, then went back to look for the anteater. He weren't there no more. Hmm. With a loaded match lock, with a match burning, the thing can detonate at any time. You have this red hot coal sitting right over top of powder. So I moved around a little bit and sure enough, there he was. I brought it up, squeeze, 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 boom. Held, 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 and nothing happened. We went back. Close the cover on the powder pan, relit the match, threaded it back through the stock, refixed it in the cock, went back up. Okay, now where's Annie? Ah, there he is. Okay. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. Dump. Nothing. Nothing. Nada. All right. Go back, and same thing again. Third time. Go beyond it now. Clump. Burf. All right. Clump. Mm, 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 mm. Getting exasperated by about this time. All right. Through the whole thing. My trophy anteater. Yeah. Well, you know that's game being talked about. And so, that was number one. Just to prove it wasn't a fluke, I took a second one that day too. Although this time it only took three attempts to get the thing to fire. Now, can you imagine going into combat with such a gun or trying to shoot game with it? You'd have to be in a hide or blind. Your game would have to be almost right in front of you. You'd have to have almost ideal ignition conditions. And this doesn't often happen in warfare. And you can imagine some samurai warrior in his armor coming down on you ah! while you're fiddling around with trying to get your gun to shoot. I suspect quite a few uh, match lockmen in Japan lost their heads before they got the guns to fire. But that's what shooting a match lock is like. So if you want the ultimate in a hunting experience and don't want to bother with cleaning much game, there's an alternative for you. Use the match lock. I guarantee you, you'll have that result. Last time we talked about the mysteries of the match lock. And today, or now, uh, we're going to talk about flint locks. But first, about today. Another wonderful day. Beautiful weather. Took a nice zebra. One shot. One zebra dead. And did this with a 45 caliber night rifle. So you couldn't ask for a better result. a nice old stallion, so a, a truly a trophy zebra. But 
now we're going to talk about the flintlock. Now for those who are not familiar with flintlocks, flintlocks use a rock, actually a piece of flint, that strikes against a steel frizzle and throws a spark down in a pan containing powder, which hopefully ignites your powder charge sticking in the barrel so everything can go kaboom that way. Well, I've shot flint, shot a fair amount of flint. But I decided that I wanted to do a handgun hunt with a flintlock pistol. Now I had a problem, because where I live in Georgia, at the time, the flintlock pistol had to develop 500 foot-pounds of muzzle energy at 100 yards. That is a lot of energy to get out of a pistol barrel, particularly with a black powder load. So casting about in the catalogs, I found one. Had potential. It was made by David Peter Solly in Italy, a very well-known and respected maker. Been shooting Peter Solly guns for decades, so I know him well. And the gun had enough barrel to do some good. It was called the Bounty. And the pistol is this long. No exaggeration. It has 14 plus inches of barrel and a stock at this end and of course a flintlock firing mechanism and loads from the muzzle. Muzzle loader, of course. Well, Bouncing Bounty arrived in due time but I didn't know it was bouncing yet. And so I took it out to shoot it. Well, the instructions weren't much help. Obviously, David, Peter Solly, and I had different opinions of what this pistol was going to be used for. Because the charge they recommended was about 35 grains of black powder and a patch round ball. Well, that's fine for plinking and target use and such things. But I wanted to kill beasts with it, and this was far from the 500 foot-pounds required by Georgia law. So obviously I needed a heavier load. Well, having other Peter Solly firearms, I was fortunate and I was able to examine the proof marks. And it seems that the pistol was actually proofed to the same pressure, used the same breech mechanism, as the rifle barrels of similar diameter. Aha! Uh -huh. If it was proof to the same pressure, then I could use a heavier load. Even so, I had to proceed with caution. So slowly I developed the load, increasing it, increasing it, increasing it, until finally I met the state's velocity and energy requirement. I was using, in 50 caliber, a 225 grain bullet, and 85 grains of double FG black powder. There was only one small problem. I could not hold on to the thing. When you got out there, even grasping it with two hands and shooting, the pistol would fly from your grasp, revolve through the air, and if I was lucky, I would catch it in midair by the cock or some other inconvenient part but got clobbered on the side of the head with it twice as it came down. So, hence its name, Bouncing Bounty. Obviously, I needed to do something about that. Well, there were several options. I suppose I could have had a little weight machine to add on the end of the barrel, but that was expensive and beyond my capabilities. So I'd already made a holster from an old shirt just to hold it. Well, obviously, holsters for pistols this long ain't very common. And I had a pocket left over. Aha. Uh -huh. Saddlebags. So we took some lead shot, we put it in the pocket, and draped it over the end of the barrel, put some electrical tape around it, and we had saddlebags. And we had weight. And then I could hold the pistol. Got the load developed, shot well. 
So then all I need to do is find some gain for it. Well, that opportunity presented itself. Florida has an outstanding muzzleloading season where you can take a deer with 15 inches of horn, uh, a hog 18 inches at the shoulder, and other, as well as an Osceola turkey. And you can do this in one week. So we, in Bouncing Bounty, went down to Florida. I don't know if anybody can imagine hunting deer from palm trees, but that's exactly what we did. Found a palm tree, a nice open bay out there, swamps on both sides. Shimmied up the palm tree with my climbing stand and sat there and waited for something to come along. And in due time, about the third day of the hunt, we had a nice deer. Saw him up over 100 yards off, crossed the bay, walked down the trail. Aha, uh -huh. cocked, mm, bully. Deer ran. Fluff, 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 across the bay. And at the edge of the timber on the other side, crashed, went down. Dead deer, one shot. Right where it was meant to go, right through the shoulder. The bouncing bounty had done its job. Well, that was good. So, fueled by that success, I tried another flintlock pistol. Shorter this time. Bigger caliber, though. 58 caliber. Used a 45 caliber bullet that was encapsulated in a sabot to fill the oversized bore. About the same powder charge, 85 grains. And sat down. Here comes a hog. Hog is about 12 feet away. Even though this pistol doesn't have any rear sight, at 12 feet, almost anything pointed would work. I pull the trigger, <coughs> and instantly the palmettos in front of me were aflame. And the hog ran off squealing. What in the world had happened? After I stomped out the flames, I had an idea to about what had happened. I remembered about a Two days before, when I'd been carrying that pistol, I'd heard something fall. And what fell was the lead bullet. The sabot remained in the bore, so when you ran the ramrod down, yeah, that was something down there. It was a proper length. But the bullet, unfortunately, was long gone. So we learned something about that one. In conclusion... You want to take up hunting with a flintlock pistol? Well, very possible, very likely, be successful. But you'll uh, you'll have some interesting experiences. I don't know if you have noticed, but I believe that hound dogs generate what are known as sleep ions. Notice when a mama hound dog lays down with the puppies and she goes to sleep, you let 10 or 12 puppies, they all go to sleep too. And this is done through these sleep ions. They're emanated from the mother dog and they flow on air currents to the puppies and they also work on people. If you want to get a good night's sleep, you take your dog and you bring it in the bedroom with you and you let it go to sleep. And after a little while, you'll receive a very strong impulse to do exactly the same. Very active children put in the presence of sleeping dogs. Calm down, then if they're, you know, like two or three years old, well, get ready for a nap. Works on them too. Now how does this possibly work? Well, we know that the dog's sense of smell is something like a million times more effective than our own. So it should not be surprising that signals from scent have an effect on, on dogs. 
Well, it takes a little longer to work. They also have an effect on people. Dogs also cannot understand why we don't smell better than we do, meaning why we are not able to smell things to the same intensity as they do. You know very well that dogs love to roll in something rotten, rotten meat especially, and then bring that into the house and dance around and say, oh, don't I smell so good. And we go, ew. Well, that's that our sense of smell is not uh, sufficiently advanced to appreciate all the delicate nuances that the dogs do. They also can't understand why we can't see in the dark. They can. Why can't we? Well, we stumble around in the dark and are near dark, and they see perfectly well. And when we stumble over them, we look up and, well, why didn't you see me? I was laying right there in front of you. So there are a lot of differences between dogs and people. But if people would look at things from the hound dog point of view, it all makes perfect sense. Today we went shotgunning. And that was an interesting experience. I've never hunted uh, in the company of lions and leopards, and rhinoceroses and elephants and such things. So we went out with our double barrel smoothbore 12 gauge and went in pursuit of what we could find. Well, we did manage to get a guinea fowl and two different species of Franklin grouse. And the hunt was very interesting in the sense that you just don't wander around this part of the African bush with a load of bird shot in your hand when any time what you may flush might be a lion instead of a bird. So you spot the birds on the road and you pursue them and these things don't like to fly. So if you must take them on the ground, you take them on the ground. If you can get them to flush, you flush them and shoot them. And we were successful at doing a little of both, but a lot of running around, and uh, we did manage a few birds. Wing shooting with muzzle-loading guns has always been an interest of mine. And perhaps the pinnacle of the experience is hunting literally the elephant of the waterfowl world. And this is the North American swan. The tundra swan, so-called, if you hold it by the neck, its feet would be about the ground level. It is a huge bird. The neck is about this long. There are a few areas in North America where it's legal to shoot tundra swans. It's carefully controlled by permit. A hunter may take only one swan a year. But in North Carolina, there are 35,000 that come, and so they allow hunters to take three to 5,000 a year. And this stabilizes the population and gives a very unique experience. The first time I went swan hunting was with Bess. Now Bess is a flintlock muzzleloader, 75 caliber, 11 gauge, this tall. Great big cock, flint about that wide, a full inch. And it strikes across an inch of steel. And when that happens, sparks are apt to fly. So the gun is very reliable, albeit slow to load. And being cylinder bore, it has no choke. But I'd already taken deer with this gun and I'd taken small game with it, so nothing would do, but I had to go to North Carolina and shoot me one of these white flying elephant things. Swan, in other words. So uh, we do that. I contract with a guide, and they hunt swan in an interesting fashion. They put out swan decoys. Now, normal decoys get, these days, pretty big. Well, a swan decoy is like a bathtub with a head on it. And so you put half a dozen swan decoys out there and you get in your blind and you proceed to call the swan when you see them. 
and it sounds rather like somebody calling cows. Whoop! 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 And they respond. So we had set up and we'd gone and we'd sat in the swan blind during the morning but didn't have anything close. So we came back in the afternoon. And so the guide saw some swan coming over there and he so said, well, those might work. You know, get ready. So he called, whoop, 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 and here they came. Boom, 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 boom. Took them a long time to get there, but here they came. It looks like this was going to be a good one. Well, they liked those decoys. As a matter of fact, they liked them so well they landed just outside the decoys on the water. Well, dog did not like that much. So despite being told to hold back, he went after the swan and flushed him. Too far for me to shoot. In the meantime, over across the pond, some guys were leaving a blind. It being late in the afternoon by now, so they were in the blind and moving around out there and the swan saw them. So he turned, one of the swan turned around and flew back towards us. It looked like he was going to pass on the opposite end of the blind where I was. So I climbed over three people to get over to the proper end of the blind to shoot. Got down, got my gun ready, primed, nerf. Ready. Whoop! 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 On he came. Now these are beautiful white, white birds and they just sort of plow through the air. Finally, the guide said, if you're going to take him, you know, do it now. So I pulled up the gun and caught on a piece of brush on the edge of the blind. So the bird was now passing slightly behind us. Pulled it up over the, over the brush, pulled ahead and pulled the trigger. Whoa! Well, I couldn't really see what was going on because my vision was completely blinded by this cloud of smoke. The guys in the other blind told me that they saw this pillar of smoke come out of the blind and envelop the swan, and the swan fall out of the bottom of it. And then, when the smoke cleared a little bit, I could see it laying quite dead on the water. And the guys in the blind over there cheered. I got cheers and applause for that. And that was certainly a very memorable hunting experience. Now, incidentally, on another year, I took the same double barrel shotgun I used here, and I took a swan with it uh, also in the Lake Matamuskeet area. But this is probably the ultimate in the muzzle-loading waterfowl experience. Because in the bird world, truly you are taking an elephantine-sized bird, and it's a wonderful thing to do. And you know what? They eat good, too. There's no better tasting waterfowl than swan. And here is a swan on the Christmas dinner table. And yeah, this is what I usually do with them. Now, besides extreme muzzleloading, I'm the author of other books that also feature some aspects of muzzleloading hunting. Now, this include backyard deer hunting. Now, I do have a series of e-books on muzzleloading. Include muzzleloaders for hunters, Shooting and Maintaining Your Muzzle Loader, Hunting with Muzzle Loading Shotguns and Smoothbore Muskets, and Hunting Big and Small Game with Muzzle Loading Pistols. And these you can find on Amazon.com and other sources. Now, Spear Safari has photo safaris as well as hunting safaris, and you can find them at their website. For more information on my books, blogs, and videos, you can go to my website, www.hoviesmith.com. Good hunting and good eating from the outdoors. Goodbye!
and God bless.